business and politics with Roby Brock. And welcome to the program. We're glad to have you with us on this Sunday morning. I'm Roby Brock. The back half of the week in Washington, D.C. was largely consumed with congressional debate over a proposed agreement between the U.S. and Iran over nuclear weapons, unfreezing assets, and lifting sanctions. Joining me to talk politics is Senator Tom Cotton, who is staunchly opposed to the deal. Uh, and he sits on the Intelligence and Armed Services Committees. Welcome, Senator. Good to have you in studio and in person. Roby, it's good to be back in person. Thank you. Uh, all right. Let's talk about what uh, has happened and transpired this week uh, in Washington, D.C. The Senate could not pass a measure to disapprove of the deal. Would it be a different dynamic if there was a proposal to pass the deal? Or you think the votes would be about the same? Well, this is a nuclear arms control agreement with a mortal enemy. If the president had followed the Constitution and followed the example of most of his predecessors and submitted this deal as a treaty, it would have required a two-thirds up or down vote. And 58 senators, Democrats and Republicans alike, are opposed to it. So clearly, it wouldn't have been ratified. Uh, but because the president chose to disregard the Constitution and go it alone, then he was able to rely on a small partisan minority of only Democrats in the Senate to keep this deal moving forward. Uh, which regrettably reflects the low level of support he has across the American public. You know, two to one majorities of the American people oppose this deal. The president has the votes, though, as you indicated, for the strategy that he's undertaken. What is your strategy now, those who oppose it? What is your strategy now besides really just complaining in the media about it? I mean, what else can you do now specifically? Well, there's going to be an immediate test in the coming uh, four months. In October, Iran has to come clean with all of the past military work of its nuclear program to the International Atomic Energy Agency. Then in December, the IAEA has to issue its report. I'll be watching very closely as a member of the Intelligence Committee and the Armed Services Committee to ensure the IAEA doesn't whitewash that report under pressure from the Obama administration or other Western European negotiating partners. Second, the IAEA also has two side deals with Iran governing its past military work in its nuclear program. We still have not seen the content of those side deals. I therefore believe that the Obama administration is not complying with federal law, federal law which President Obama himself signed earlier this year requiring him to submit all those deals to Congress before he could waive sanctions. And that so would th give you guys 60 days to review that? Yes. So, so I would contend, as, as the House has contended in a formal vote this week, the President doesn't truly have the authority to move forward with waiving of sanctions and therefore we might contemplate legal action as a, con as a Congress to stop the President from waiving those sanctions earlier next year. So, but would it, so it would reset the clock, potentially, if you got to start over with uh, those side agreements. There's obviously the legal challenge that you just referenced right there. How would that change things, though? Is there something that you think could come out in one well, of those side deals that would sway your opinion to another position? I, I, I feel like you would well, not change your mind. The things that would change, the, the fundamental thing that would change, the President wouldn't be able to waive the sanctions and therefore the deal itself wouldn't go forward, which means not only the long-term nuclear consequences of the deal with Iran being on the path to nuclear weapons capability, but more immediately, no tens of billions of dollars in sanctions relief for Iran to continue funding its terrorist proxies and its client states around the region like Hezbollah and Hamas and Bashar al-Assad. That's the most immediate consequence that we would be focused on stopping. Tell me, do you think that there is a way in this day and age to bring Iran into the league of nations? I mean, they're, they've been a long time enemy of the United States. This is um, an approach the president has taken to try to find a way to perhaps build a bridge in terms of uh, relationships. Is there a way to do that without having to be hardliner, military, always being on this um, aggressive fence with them? Is there if, a way to change that? If Iran wants to be treated as a normal nation, Iran has to start acting like a normal nation. It, can't, that mean? it, it can't remain the world's worst state sponsor of terrorism. It can't continue to foment unrest and civil war in places like Iraq and Syria and Yemen. It has to come clean on its nuclear program the way countries like South Africa did. But for 36 years, Many elites in the West have been looking at Iran saying change is just around the corner. The people are about to rise up. The Iranian people are a natural ally of the United States and the West. Unfortunately, they're governed by radical ayatollahs who continue to oppress them domestically while they also engage in aggressive behavior outside of their own borders. So until that changes, Iran will not be a part of the civilized world. It will be an adversary of the civilized world and the United States and our citizens. Well, if we've had this friction and this, this block for 36 years, why is it going to change if we keep doing the status quo? 
Well, Ar Iran did stop its nuclear program, according to our intelligence community, in 2003, after Iran had seen the United States military take down the Taliban, after they had seen the government of Saddam Hussein fall in just three weeks, something Iran couldn't accomplish itself in the 1980s in nine years. It did stop when there was a credible threat of military force on both of its borders. Unfortunately, over time, that threat diminished. And then under Barack Obama, that threat, I would argue, more or less disappeared. So Iran, if they face a credible threat of military force, they might be willing to give more on their nuclear programs, and they would probably be less aggressive in conventional actions as well. But that's the only language that the Ayatollahs speak is the threat of force. There is, uh, obviously, to play devil's advocate, is a, a line of thought in Israel, in the Middle East, that says that a rejection of this deal could lead to more of a, a position of strength for the hardliners in Iran to continue to say, look at what they're doing here. This is, they're, they're not bringing us in. Don't, how do you counter that argument that this rejection of this deal could strengthen the hardliners' position? Well, I, I would say, unfortunately, there's very little other than hardliners in Tehran. Take their new president, Hassan Rouhani, who was elected in 2013. He was portrayed as a moderate. Yet, remember, of the hundreds of people who filed to run for president, only he and a few others were allowed by the Ayatollahs to be a candidate. There's a reason for that. He was in charge of mass repression of student revolts uh, about 15 years ago. He was in charge of a while of nuclear negotiations. He's boasted about his lying to the West of, about their nuclear program. So while he and their foreign minister, Javed Zarif, may be the pleasing and soothing front that Iran presents to the West, to the soft and gullible leaders who want to avoid confrontation at all costs, in fact, the hardliners are truly what, who's in charge in Iran, and they always have been. When I was in Israel last week, there was widespread support across the government and the opposition, Prime Minister Netanyahu and the leaders of opposition parties, to include down to the proverbial man on the street that this is a bad deal, not only because it gives Iran the nuclear capability down the road to achieve its dream of wiping Israel off the map, and striking the great Satan, what it calls the United States, but also it gives them tens of billions of dollars to continue funding terror on Israel's borders right now. So there's a way that this could play out politically and uh, to your satisfaction, and then there is a way that it could play out perhaps more realistically if you don't get your way uh, on some things that you've expressed objections to. What do you think happens next? Give me a crystal ball for what happens in the coming months. Well, I, I don't think uh, Iran is going to come clean in October on the past military work of its nuclear program. It will really depend in large part on whether the IE whitewashes the report or tells the truth on it. That will determine whether the president moves forward with lifting sanctions. But even if sanctions are lifted in early next year, say February or March, that's only 10 or uh, 11 months until we have a new president. And I would suggest that most international companies who might look at Iran as a promising market are going to be reluctant when they see a two-to-one majority among the American people and near uh, three-fifths majority in both the House and the Senate opposing this deal to rush into Iran to change the facts on the ground, to give them tens of billions of dollars and more in new economic might when they know everything may change in January 2017. All right, we'll see what happens. Senator Tom Cotton, thank you so much for being here. Good to Thanks be with you, as good always. Good to be with you. All right, after the break, Senator John Bozeman from Washington, D.C. We're going to focus on some domestic controversies and